All right, we're live. Welcome everyone to our um, school nurse webcast where we will be discussing um, end of the year and uh, beyond. Um, I'm Angie McDonald. I'm the Kentucky Department of Education um, Education Nurse Consultant and we have um, a, several things on our agenda today. So um, I'm going to, we'll just move along um, fairly quickly so we can um, value everyone's time. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, today we are gonna um, have updates from the Kentucky Department of Public Health. Um, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Connie White here with us. Um, she will be going over some of the updates uh, from the CDC and answer um, questions that you may have. Uh, we also will have an, uh, another uh, DPH update from uh, Michelle Malicote, their um, school nurse consultant, and um, infinite campus updates, some KDE updates, and we wanna give you lots of time to be able to answer, um, ask any questions that you may have. Um, you can, um, you won't be able to speak on this uh, webcast, but you will be able to type in any questions that you have on in, through our chat um, button and submit those questions to us. And if we, we will do our best to answer them today. If it's something that we don't have an answer for, um, we will uh, work on it. We're gonna make note of that. And we are going to publish a question and answer document that we will post on our KDE Student Health Services webpage, along with the recording of this video and PowerPoint. Um, and look for those to be available by the first of next week. All right, um, next slide, please. All right, with um, no further delay, I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Connie White and um, as she has a lot of great information to share. Dr. White. Uh, thank you so much, Angie. A pleasure to be here this afternoon, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I know it has been one busy year. I'd like everybody to take a big, deep breath in your nose and out your mouth. I'm an old OBGYN physician, and I've been used to telling people to breathe in your nose and out your mouth for a long time, but if anybody feels like they've given birth over this last 15 months, I would think it would be school nurses. Y'all have put so many hats on, done so many different things, provided so much peace and reassurance to so many people, not just your students who are your primary focus, but their parents, their caregivers, uh, the people that you work with, the staff in your school system, your administrators, uh, they don't tell you enough, but you are the glue that holds uh, them together if we, uh, in public health, we are very good about not letting any tragedy go by, that we don't put some lipstick on that pig and, and figure out a way to make something good come out of it. And I think this whole uh, pandemic tragedy has shown us how absolutely critical school nurses are. Uh, if people didn't know that before, surely if they've been halfway paying attention, they know it now. So as we look at all of the things that are happening in the state and across the country, uh, what can we do to be prepared for the next time? Because there will be some type of a next time. Uh, and how can we be prepared to be sure that we've got a school nursing infrastructure in place that's not just women and, and men working 24 seven to try to make it work, but how can we fix a system that works comfortably, that provides you with what you need so you can then in turn provide that for the patients that you see. So uh, I know today is not school nurse day, but uh, it, we want to make it school nurse day today. Today is the night, the day that we celebrate. A year ago, May the, the 18th, uh, 2020, we were in the dark, we were scared, we didn't know what to do for sure because we didn't have any information. We do not have the kind of information we would like to have on COVID-19, but we know so much more and we are not in the dark 
right now we are heading toward a horizon that is is very exciting, very uplifting, and nobody has ever been able to go through this kind of a pandemic at the pace we've gone through it. And you've been there the whole time. You've worked yourselves to death. And, and I just can't thank you enough for what you've done for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I wanted to tell you where we are with our COVID update right now. Uh, whatever I tell you right now could change tonight or tomorrow morning or next Thursday. I don't know that. And it's interesting because people will complain because uh, we don't know what's going on. We don't have enough data. And then when we get new data and we change the system, it's people complaining because we change all the time. Now we don't really change all the time, but anytime there's a change, it's very upsetting. It changes systems. We have to rewrite guidance. People have to re-remember things. Um, but I think it shows that we are making progress. So as we keep changing things, whether it's too often or not often enough, we do know that the current guidance from the CDC says that there will be no changes to guidance on the COVID-19 pandemic in this K through 12 system through the end of this school year. So you don't have to learn or remember anything different while you're in your school setting. Everything that's in healthy at schools and the supporting documents, those, those great supporting documents that uh, KDE has put together and consolidated into that 2.0 document, they will stay the same till the end of this school year. Now, fasten your seat belts. I have a, a very, every intention of thinking that the CDC is going to change a lot of things this summer. How quickly they do that will determine whether that's going to affect summer school or whether that will go on and affect the fall. I can't answer that question. After practicing OBGYN for 20 years, saying to a patient, I don't know, was not something I was used to doing. But I can tell you, I have said, I don't know. I don't know how many times this year. There is so much we don't know. There's so much we don't know about the, the virus, and there's also so much we don't know about how this is going to be managed at the direction of the CDC. So we wake up every morning and we check our phones and see if anything changed last night, and then we take that information and apply it to our students and staff in the best way that we can do that to be sure that they are safe and healthy. Um, we do know that it, it's important that you think about all these federal federal dollars coming in. One of our big challenges in the Department for Public Health, we're getting funding to help us with data systems and to help us with public health worker uh, uh, development and help us in, in all different kinds of ways. Think about the things that you need and can use in your setting in your school nurse um, facility that you work in right now. What kind of supplies do you need? What kind of equipment do you need? What kind of renovations could you need? And work through that, get a plan in mind and, and take that to your, your administration and say, these are the supports that I need for my students and for the staff and, and, and explain and show your, uh, your administrators that there are ways that we can really improve school nursing. Maybe even, you know, I mean, I know I'm going out on a limb. Maybe we even hire some more school nurses so you don't have one nurse to eight gazillion patients like so many of you are in a situation that you're dealing with. So think of this as an opportunity because you've got the insight that a lot of people don't have. What things can you do in your school system that can improve the health of everyone? Share those ideas uh, with your administrator. I've had a lot of questions about contact tracing and many of you have put on a completely new hat that you didn't have in the past of contact tracing. Actually, you've all done contact tracing with other illnesses that have communicable diseases that have happened in your schools, but the COVID contact tracing was kind of the mother of all contact tracing for many of you. This is an opportunity over the summer to talk with your local health department if you are doing the contact tracing in your area and say, where are we going to go with this now? Is this something, what level of assistance do you still need? Because 
we all know that you know these students better than anybody does. And so even with if the health department takes over the, con the complete contact tracing, you still will be a tremendous resource for them so that they're sure they're able to find that patient that is positive and make sure that they've got all the right students and staff contacted to be sure that um, we are able to isolate the person that's ill and make sure that anyone they've been in contact with doesn't uh, uh, get the disease and, and infect someone else. Um, it's going to be really important that you be aware. Uh, and if you're not on this listserv, I would think you're on the, the uh, Angie's listserv or you wouldn't be on this call. But if you are just doing this because you heard from it some other way other than the listserv, get your name on the listserv because the Maternal Child Health Division in the Department for Public Health is in the process of planning a pediatric nurse course that's going to be happening towards the end of the summer. So that'll have nursing credits. Uh, and as soon as that information is available. I hope we'll be sending a save the date out soon so you can get it on your calendar and this will just give you an opportunity to have some really good updates on new and exciting things in nursing that you need to know about to take with you in, into the fall uh, school year. Uh, this is preaching to the choir, but I'm going to say it anyway. Be sure that you start thinking about well child visits and making sure that you're scanning your students to see if they've had it and if not, help them get to their uh, uh, to their uh, medical home to get that done. Um, lots of things haven't happened in the last year. 2020, as Dr. Stack said on one of the press conferences with the governor, 2020 has been a mess. I think that's I think we should have t-shirts that say that uh, because it has been a mess and so well child visits have not been happening as they should have happened and that goes hand in hand with immunizations real important that we catch our kids up on our immunizations the last thing we want to do is to come out of this covid pandemic and then about november of this year end up with a measles outbreak because kids miss those routine immunizations so with all the things that you have to do and i know there's thousands of them making sure we get our kids evaluated and making sure we get in get them immunized. Last week the CDC came out with and the governor uh, uh, shared with our state that if you are fully vaccinated, that means you've gotten all of your vaccinations for whichever COVID, uh, whichever vaccine of, that you received, and then you're two weeks past that last dose that's fully vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. Uh, I, I, I know that that is exciting news and I know it got everybody all wound up, but what people missed was the announcement where the CDC said, and if you go in and it's time for your routine immunizations and you haven't gotten a COVID vaccination, you can get it at the same time. That is like way exciting new news. Uh, and I think it got lost in the translation. So I'm I'm hoping you can share that information with your parents and your caregivers and make sure everybody knows that as we are now vaccinating 12 and up, they can get their COVID vaccination at the same time of their routine vaccination. And uh, if I have my crystal ball out and I'm reading tea leaves, uh, it looks like that there may be in enough information and enough data by the end of this summer. Uh, a lot of people, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but a lot of people are predicting that we're going to have vaccination for the even younger kids. So stay tuned for that. We don't know if and when that's going to happen, uh, but we have opportunities to get our kids vaccinated uh, in ways that we never have. If you you've got a, a, a student that needs a sports physical, be sure you, you know, plug the fact that they need to get their immunizations done at that sports physical if that provider is capable of doing that. Uh, this will be a great opportunity because if we can get, the more we can get our students vaccinated, then the less contact tracing there's going to be, the less uh, qu uh, quarantined classrooms, the less quarantined marching bands, the less quarantined debate teams, the less quarantined uh, football schedules. A tremendous uh, number of our football games last fall were canceled uh, because uh, the teams were in quarantine. So the more we can push that and make the vaccination appear to be a much more normalized part of school life, uh, 
uh, I think that's going to help us uh, with our vaccination rates. Uh, as you're looking at your consent forms for the start of the, the school year, uh, if that's an opportunity for you to add uh, COVID vaccination language in, uh, that might be something that you can work on with your school team this summer to be sure that, uh, that, that we get that in the mix so that we're not there at the last minute uh, trying to add that on because uh, as we've done so many last minute things as as new things have shown up i know how that last minute flailing is and i certainly don't want y'all to have to to have to do that and we are anticipating sometime in the next school year uh if once all the safety data is in that younger kids will be vaccinated below age 12. so we'll have to wait on that but getting that language into the consent forms would be something that would make that go a lot easier uh going forward uh, the next slide, if you'll pull that up, Angie, uh, this is a slide that Dr. Stack shared with the superintendents on the, I think it was the 11th. Uh, that was, was that just last week? Wow, that was just last week. Uh, this is an opportunity we're sharing with, with schools. Uh, if your school wants to do a vaccination clinic, they are certainly welcome to contact their local health department. Many of our local health departments do have the capacity and the ability to manage a clinic either at your um, at your school or at a, a district site. Uh, you could get schools in a whole district come to the same place uh, with the local health department. Some of our local hospitals who have vaccine have volunteered and have done vaccination clinics for us, which are wonderful. But this opportunity is a group called Wild Health. Uh, they are uh, were originally a testing group. And when we needed at the Department for Public Health a way to, to develop a team that could go in and be kind of like a turnkey style uh, group who walks into a space you give them and they bring the, va the, uh, uh, the uh, they bring the people, they bring the supplies, they bring the vaccine, they bring the data collection equipment and enter all of this into the Kentucky Immunization, Immunization Registry. That re just means that the location, the facility has to apply, uh, provide them a space and market the fact that they're going to be there and they come in and do all of that. There's no cost to the school. There's no cost to anyone who gets this done. So this is an option that I just wanted you to be aware of. This can be done for private schools. This can be done for public schools. Uh, so this is something that's available to you. Um, uh, they do have, as I said, they were originally a testing group and they're also offering testing. If anybody wants one, it's certainly not required to get a vaccine, uh, but just want you to be aware that there are many different ways that we can get our schools hooked up with, uh, with vaccination uh, that's out there. Um, those were the things I mainly wanted to go over with everyone today. I think there will probably be questions. So uh, if there are questions now, um, okay, there are questions now. I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, and I'm also prepared to stick around through this webcast. As people think of questions, I'll be available to answer them later. Angie, is there anything else that I need to review today? I think these were all of my notes that I jotted down to be sure that I didn't skip anything that you thought was important. Oh, I think we're good. Um, Laura, do we have a question? We do. OK, great. So thankfully, to our knowledge, we have not seen any spread from a COVID positive student to another student who is quarantined through contact tracing in our schools. Is it possible we will not have to contact trace in the classrooms by the opening of school in the fall? Um, that's a good question, and I'm just going to project. I think as long as we have a virus that's spread by respiratory uh, droplets and, and uh, aerosolization like we have, we're probably going to continue to contact trace. But if we continue to see vaccinations and fewer and fewer cases, there are fewer adults that are exposing the kids, so the kids are going to be less likely to have uh, COVID-19, uh, then I think we're going to see less and less and less cases. So the contact tracing uh, load will be 
a whole different world. So I think we will probably still be contact tracing, but my hope and my prayer is that this is going to be a very, very low number of people. Another question? It's the only one we have right now. Okay. All right. Well, I have I, well, I have one that was sub, just texted okay. to me actually, right. and I think I know the answer, but I'm going to let you weigh in. Um, okay. They're asking if um, thinking for the fall, and I know we don't know yet for sure, right. but should they plan on keeping their separate isolation rooms um, now that they're going back to 100% capacity? Um, building administrators really kind of want that space back, if possible. That's a really good question, and and I think you probably in the back of your mind would need to think about what are you going to do with a positive person, whether it's a student or a staff member. Uh, if you've got somebody that suddenly shows up that it's COVID positive uh, or appears to be COVID positive, it's still the same disease we had last year. We still had uh, 6,600 Kentuckians die from it. So. I think we need to have a plan. Now that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have an isolated room for that, but you have to have a plan. What would you do with that person? Um, is there some kind of construction that can happen with some of the, the funding that we talked about that, that would make sense to set something up so you could commandeer? Because you're not talking about keeping that person in isolation for a long period of time. It's until someone can come and take them home. Um, so I still think you would have to have a plan, just as if you had somebody that showed up with a rash and you thought they might have the measles. You have a plan of where you're going to put them uh, until they can can get the proper care. Is that the answer you thought I was going to say, Andy? Yes, yes. I, and I, I answered that right. Good. Thank you. You did. <laughs> well, and, and remember that, you know, in our flu plans, you know, we want you to isolate those kids, infectious kids, till they're picked up. So as far as the school nurse and me says keep on keeping on so i'm glad to have your <laughs> your well, opinion and, as well and get prepared because we didn't have hardly any flu this year i know many of you weren't in in an actual in in um, person to person school but our numbers for that we track here at the department for public health for flu were were almost non-existent and that's because people were wearing face masks and they were socially distancing and they were washing their hands so you're going to have to dust off your your flu protocols because you didn't have to use them this last year um, and and i will suspect uh that i, I know i've heard folks in the long-term care community talking about the fact that when flu season happens again i know my mother uh, who's 91 Net doesn't leave her house during flu season because she knows at her age with her frailty, she says a case of flu would kill me, wouldn't it? And my answer to her is absolutely it would. So I think I'm going to see her and I hope the rest of our society be much more likely in a flu season to wear a mask to protect themselves. And I think I know I'm personally going to be more likely to if I have a cold, I'm going to wear a mask because that protects other people around me. So I'm hoping that we have gotten over being, I don't know if we were afraid of masks or as an OBGYN physician, I spent a whole bunch of my professional career wearing a mask. So wearing a mask in this whole last year has not been for 15 months has not been that big of a deal for me, but it has been for a lot of people. And so I'm hoping we recognize that something as simple as a two layer cloth mask can really change the trajectory of an illness, whether it's COVID or whether it's flu or whether it's the common cold. Any other we questions, do. Laura? Yeah, we have a few more. OK. Most of our staff are reaching the three month post immunization immunity. Is it still guidance that they will have to quarantine after three months? No, that has been. Are you talking about people who got vaccinated or people who were sick with COVID? I'm going to assume vaccination. Vaccinated. 
when uh, that guidance first came out, that is what they they told us was that after you've been vaccinated for three months, you don't have to quarantine. And the reason they said that was that was all the, the data they had was three months worth of data. The vaccines were so new. Now, with a longer period of time has passed and they're seeing those vaccine uh, those uh, levels, blood levels showing that people who've been vaccinated past that 90 days still have a very robust response from the vaccine. So no, after you've been vaccinated, you don't have to quarantine if you're asymptomatic, no symptoms. And you also uh, right now in Kentucky don't have to wear a mask. OK, and that would work the same way for a student, correct? Oh, correct. Absolutely. Yes. OK, so that's so, going to be very exciting. So if you've got a classroom where the, the, the kids that have been vaccinated are exposed to someone who is positive, as long as those kids are asymptomatic, they don't have to quarantine. OK, does well can, help? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, was gonna say, I can hear the high fives going on out there in the audience. So. So what about Wild Health? Um, does Wild Health require a certain number number of participants to come to the site to do vaccine clinics? No, I don't I don't believe so. They they will want to know how many you're projecting to be there because they don't want to bring an army of people and five folks show up, uh, but they also don't want to bring a small number and, and 200 people show up either. So so I'm, I'm sure that there will be registration uh, to to get that done, uh, just as any anybody would need that for the logistical planning. Uh, but I do not believe that there's a a, a, t a size limit. You just go and you request it, and you you tell them how many you think, and then you set up your registration, pick your time, uh, and then get the vaccinations done. Something that I will talk about that I, I'm not really supposed to talk about yet because we don't have any plans. The plans are going into place. We are getting a grant from uh, HRSA to pay for COVID-19 testing. So we are in the process of, of uh, developing an RFP, which is about ready to go out so we can have people bid on the ability to do testing. So just as we've got a turnkey group like Wild Health that can come in and do vaccination, we are going to open up to any uh, laboratory in the state that wants to do vaccinations in schools as well. I'm sorry, that wants to do testing in schools as well. So if you have a school that says we want to test 10% of uh, the, the the education community every two weeks or we want to test all the field trip people or we want to test all the sports people or what whatever works for your situation we are going to have a similar type of setup so that there can be testing uh, I can't give you any more information than that not because I'm trying to be secretive but I don't want to give you information that's incorrect because we are still in the process of working with the Department of uh, uh, education to figure out how we can offer this to public and private schools throughout the state. So that should be ready uh, by this fall. OK, do you think? Do you think the student will still be required to wear a mask and socially distance in the fall? And then there's another question under it that kind of goes with that that is regarding elementary students and um, if they'll be required to wear their masks since they're not eligible for a vaccine. Uh, for the students and staff that have been vaccinated, once they're fully vaccinated, two weeks after that last dose, then I would project that they will not be require a masking. So that's we're talking about the 12 and up age group. Um, and I would project that by the time um, that, that we will be having vaccination available for younger kids. Now, that being said, the CDC may feel like that once we've gotten the 12 and over population vaccinated, they may decide not to do masking for kids. I have no idea and wouldn't even know how to guess that one. So I don't have an answer for that second question, but people that have been fully vaccinated, regardless of their age, I will project that the CDC will say they don't have to wear masks. OK, are districts going to be required to report positive cases and quarantines through their summer school programs and into the fall? Oh, I really can't answer that question or you'll have to kill me, but um, I think everybody will be 
pleased soon. How's that for a non-answer? OK, are we talking about a vaccination clinic at the school where parents don't have to be present for the student to get vaccinated as long as they have signed consent? Right, this would be just like you get consent for a, a flu clinic if you're having a flu clinic if you have that vaccination certainly they're welcome to be there but uh, there's nothing specific about the covid vaccine that would require a parent to be there okay should we encourage testing for fully vaccinated with symptoms many staff members do not want to test uh, if you are fully vaccinated and you start having COVID symptoms, if I I am fully vaccinated, and if I started having COVID system I, symptoms, I would absolutely want to be tested. There is the uh, very unusual case of a fully vaccinated person getting reinfected with COVID. Fortunately, the, vo the, the amount of virus in the nasal passages is very, very small. So many of those people don't have symptoms and, and the, the volume of virus is so small, it's very difficult for them to pass it on to someone else. But you do have those vulnerable populations that I would never want to take a chance that I could infect someone. So the possibility of this even being a question is a very small possibility. But if I'm fully vaccinated and I am symptomatic after an exposure or even not after an exposure and I think that I could have COVID, I would personally get tested. And that would be the recommendation. OK, will contract contact tracing in the fall move more to look like what we do with contagious diseases such as Pertuous, which is only alerting a parent that their child was exposed as opposed to actually requiring a seven to 10 day quarantine, especially since we'll be back to 100 percent capacity. I think as long as we have this respiratory virus in the uh, the capacity that it is, the way it spreads, it is incredibly contagious. Uh, and we do know it does kill some people. Uh, and, and we haven't even talked about long COVID, the, the possibility that one in 10, I've heard everything from one in three to one in 10 people who have had COVID, even if they were not severely ill, still have long symptoms of brain fog, of fatigue, uh, cardiac disease. I've, I've got someone who's very dear to me who developed a, a horrible um, cardiac disease side effects from having had COVID. So I think we are going to do the things we need to do. If someone is positive, we're going to want to con contact those uh, initial contacts and we want to try to isolate, which we weren't able to before is as as soundly as we would have liked to. You find that one person, you isolate the to peep that person and quarantine the ones around them so it doesn't spread to anyone else. So I, I would be very surprised if they change the quarantine uh, limits uh, with COVID in the fall. OK, and all of those projections I'm making right now could all change tomorrow. These are just things that I'm projecting, but we aren't going to know what's going to happen until it happens. And a whole lot more data and a lot of people way smarter than me put all of that information in front of them and come up with a logical evidence based decision. What about the immunity for those that have had the virus? Do they have to quarantine if exposed? Uh, 90 days. Uh, they have uh, uh, 90 days after you've been diagnosed with COVID, uh, your natural immunity we are sure is strong enough to prevent you from getting reinfected. But that starts to wane very quickly after 90 days. So that's why we do recommend that people that have had COVID go ahead after they've gotten through their isolation phase at any time after that, as long as they didn't have monoclonal antibody treatment for their COVID, they can go ahead and get a vaccination right away. But that 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 immun that immunity is not going to last forever. Does Wild Health require the clinic site to be able to store the PIFSER vaccine? 
Uh, no, no, they'll they'll bring the the vi vaccinate that they'll bring the vaccine with them. That's that's the, they they're the whole package. They bring the vaccine. They bring the needles, the syringes, the band aids, the people, the data collection system. They enter all of the data, so you don't have to do any of that. You don't have to arrange for the the Pfizer vaccines. Is it true that a positive COVID test could have been positive for flu instead of COVID? I read somewhere that the COVID test could also be detecting the flu instead of COVID. Uh, no, not really, because they're they're both viruses, but they're very different. So my understanding is there's not any cross reactivity with that. So that that's not something that we've seen. OK, and we're caught up on questions. OK. Well, I have I, one more Dr. White and I'm sorry. Yes, okay. Um, this one is um, regarding an outdoor graduation, um, guidance on masks for both parents and students um, for a graduation being held before the June 11th um, cutoff date. Well, right now, if you are um, fully vaccinated. You don't have to wear a mask indoors or outdoors uh, as long as you're not in. It, it doesn't matter what as long as you're not in. If you're out, if it's an outdoor graduation, and you're fully vaccinated. You don't have to wear a mask. Uh, if you are not fully vaccinated and you are outdoors, uh, you don't have to wear a mask, but uh, you you probably you still want to do some social distancing. Outdoors is a whole lot better than indoors, but just to be cautious. Again, if it were me, and I'm probably more cautious than a lot of people would be, I would certainly not want to go to graduation. Turn out that I was positive and and infect other people in my family and my circle. But outdoors is certainly better than indoors. That's good planning on someone's part. So I so you're saying basically you would recommend that they wear a mask if they're not vaccinated. That would be my recommendation okay. until until the the governor drops the uh, the mask uh, uh, ordinance mandate on, okay. on the 11th of Jan of June. All right. And we have one more. Is yes. there an expiration for those who have ha been fully vaccinated six months, nine months, et cetera? We don't know. They are still taking the people that were in the vaccine trials. They're continuing to test their antibody levels, their ability to have immunity, and they'll continue to monitor that. That's why when someone asks, will we need boosters? We don't know that until time has passed. We have a lot of people uh, in the country that have been vaccinated almost for a full year now, people that were in those early parts of the trials. So we're looking at them and we'll continue to watch them. That will tell us how our level of immunity for those of us that got uh, vaccinated, fully vaccinated in January, February, March, April, whenever you did, um, then we can watch them and that'll inform what should happen to us. That's all the questions on my end. Okay. All right, I'll be here if people think of any throughout the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Dr. White. Sure. Um, next slide, please. Okay, this brings us to um, our second part of Department for Public Health updates. Um, I will turn it over to Michelle Malicote, the school nurse consultant for DPH. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes, you're good. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, next slide, please. So my uh, part today is talking just for a couple of minutes about the new clinical protocol for the bronchodilator rescue inhaler. We've had several questions about this so far, and uh, I'll let you, I'm going to explain to you what this is and where we are in the process of getting it all completed. So next slide, please. So as some of you will know, Senate Bill 127 was passed during this last um, legislative session, and it basically is a was a bill to allow for students with asthma or respiratory distress to have access to a bronchodilator rescue inhaler in school. Uh, next slide, please. 
So basically this bill does allow for two scenarios. One is if the student with asthma has symptoms and doesn't have uh, an inhaler at school. And the other one is for a student that actually has respiratory distress symptoms at school and has no diagnosis of asthma. So we wanted to um, also just remind you that these uh, that we do expect the students to bring their inhaler, but this is just uh, a bill for the emergency use. Uh, next slide. And so this is a little bit different from the Epi uh, protocol that we've had that we have. And basically, instead of encouraging the location to be in the school office and the cafeteria for the EpiPens, um, this bill does suggest that the inhaler be located in two in a minimum of two places, the school health, the school front office and the athletic office so that it may be administered to any students believed to be having asthma symptoms or in respiratory distress. And the other uh, thing I want to remind you is, is that to minimize the spread of the disease, these rescue inhalers and or spacers, if they have spacers, are to be used for only one student at a time and not, and they are not meant to be shared. Next slide, please. So basically, it's I think that the most important thing to know here in, in your in your pre planning is if you are if you think you may be wanting to have inhalers at school, you'll need to be getting a medical director because the medical director or talking to your medical directors, they will they will be responsible for setting up the policies. Um, and uh, basically, this just gives the framework. It talks a little bit about how you can get the, the inhalers from a prescription from a medical provider at uh, your local pharmacy. Uh, they can be donated by outside agencies if you can get that done. And then it is the district's responsibility to implement the policies and procedures for managing the student's asthma. And the Department for Public Health is charged with setting up the protocol for being able to do that. So. All right, next slide, please. Just like we did with Epi. So included in the protocol are um, common triggers for asthma, signs and symptoms of asthma, action steps for step to manage an asthma attack. <clears throat> and I've made that its own form so that if you want to print that off and tear that out of the packet and put it on display somewhere, you'll be able to have that. Uh, the how to use the dose inhaler with a spacer and the inhaler without a spacer. I have individual sheets for those if you want to put those in your med log books. Um, and there's also a YouTube link uh, for really nice short uh, YouTube videos on actually how to use those in case you have to be training somebody at the front office for that morning to be able to have uh, be able to use it. And then um, the last page is a page of references and additional resources, and I'll, I'll show you that. Oh, I won't show you that. I'll tell you about that. The page, the last page will have all the links that you need. The, a big sponsor of this bill was the American Lung Association. So I will absolutely have links there for you to find the, pro, or the policy. There'll be sample policies where you can just drop in your own district's name. And then of course your medical director will actually tell you how to give the inhaler. If it's two puffs every 20 minutes or a puff every five minutes for 30 minutes, all of that most specific things that you'll have to be that you'll have to know to be able to give the inhaler uh, will have to be designated and written out as a as a policy by your medical director. Um, the actual policy is just now or the protocol has just started the review process here at the state. I, I thought it was all finished and I was told by my supervisor Jam Bright this morning that it hasn't even gone up to be uh, approved yet. So um, it has to go up and then end up in the commissioner's office. So hopefully uh, by Ju July 1st and if not by the KSNA um, meeting that we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it during that that meeting as well. So. Uh, and if you have any questions or concerns about it before there, then this is my information. It is michelle.malicote at ky.gov. And that's my part. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michelle. Um, do I understand you have a, a new DPH member that you would like to introduce to the group? Uh, well, I'm sorry. I got my, my sound got cut off a minute. Oh. I'm sorry. Yes, um, I understand that you guys have a new employee at DPH that you wanted to announce to the group. Uh, Ruth. Ruth. 
Oh, Ruth Willard. Yes, I'm so sorry. Yes, um, Ruth Willard, Dr. Ruth Willard is our new director of nursing and she has joined uh, the DPH within the last few months and is working. Uh, I'm working hand in hand with her uh, with the uh, CSG, which is the, um, the practice guide that we have at the DPH. So and she's actually on here and uh, I want to say hello, Dr. Willard. Yes. And thank you to Dr. White. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. White. Thanks, Michelle. Next slide, please. OK, um, we're going to talk very briefly about um, Infinite Campus uh, updates and end of the year stuff. Um, Samantha Engstrom, our IC Health uh, contact, is sick today, so I'm going to try my best to step in her shoes and um, update you guys. Next slide. Okay, we have some new IC Health ad hocs that are available. They are related to, they're all in the state published folder under ad hoc reporting, filter designer, and state published. One is for chronic health conditions and it generates a list of students identified with one or more of our top nine health conditions that we report on every year. And then we'll show you if they are resolved um, or unresolved. This is one of our state reports that we pull, as I said, every summer. So this ad hoc is a nice way to look at your um, data at the end of the year to see if there's anything that needs to be cleaned up before the June 1st data pool. Um, second one, the second one I'm very excited about is um, the new option for to run a report for the COVID-19 vaccine. This report will give you a list of students that have had either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines. Um, if you enter them in IC, of course, um, the vaccine information is not a mandatory data entry requirement, but we really encourage you to do so because it will help you immensely um, if you're asked to help with contact tracing to identify who has or has not been uh, vaccinated. Uh, next slide. Um, this is just a list of our um, yearly state data reports that we pull every year. Just a reminder that this is nothing that you as a district have to submit. We um, automatically extract that data. Um, usually it's around the first Monday closest to June 1st. So if you can have your data cleaned up by um, the end of May, that would be wonderful. Things that we look at are school nurse counts, um, health office visits, chronic health conditions, like I said, we talked about before, um, school physicals for um, initial entry in sixth grade, vision screening, hearing screening, and um, dental, which we realize you know, we did not encourage this year, so there's not going to be any penalty for that data not not being there if if you wasn't able to um, do those screenings this year. Um, our immunization reports and uh, we do have BMI. It's not a mandatory screening, but some districts um, do collect that data and we want you to get credit for um, doing that. So next slide. And and we'll just segue over into my next part. Okay, I wanted to give everybody a um, quick heads up that I have um, in, updated the medication administration training uh, manual and training program to include Voltoco, which is um, the nasal diazepam. It's a rescue medication for seizures in students age six and above. So I know we have a few schools that have already had some kids um, come to school with the with the medication. So it is all uh, updated. So this may um, eliminate the need for some of the nasal midazolam, hopefully, and some of your um, other kids that, that may have popped up. It's administered exactly like Narcan. The atomizer is identical to it. Um, you, there's nothing, so you don't prime it, you just Put it in the nose and push the button basically. Very simple. Um, I also wanted to let you guys know that um, 
as we are continuing in our state of emergency, both federal and state, that any health trainings that you perform for teachers this year may be counted as professional development. Um, I know that's something that the teachers have wanted for a long time and we were able to do that th like this school year, but we're gonna be able to do so as well as the governor and the president are continuing the state of emergency. Next slide. The training manual and PowerPoints, um, like I said, I have finished those, but they're in the process of all the approval pro uh, process and whatnot. Our goal is to have them posted um, for districts by June 15th on our KDE webpage. Uh, the, you will need to request the updated exam and answer keys as we don't want to, you know, put those online to ruin the integrity of the tests. So you will need to um, request those from Samantha Ingstrom after June 15th. And when those become available and she can send those to you, um, she'll can send you ELA certificates and your other certificate of completion as well. Next slide. Um, the new school nurse orientation program. We are in uh, the process of updating that. Um, a lot of regs and things have changed um, since it was updated last. Our target date, Lord willing and the creek don't rise, is to have it ready to release by mid-September. Um, and we'll have more information we'll, as, as it comes available. We'll make sure to get that um, out through email on listserv as well. Next slide. Yes, um, COVID vaccination cards. I've had some questions about, um, can you accept a vaccination card as a proof of immunization? And that answer is yes, it is considered a legal document. You may accept copies of the card as proof. Um, to my knowledge, it is not on the immunization certificate. And from, I think it would require um, a state a change in, statute or regulation to even do to add it so um, you may accept the vaccination cards and as i said earlier um, we recommend you enter covid vaccines if that into i see if that information is provided to you just to make life easier with contact tracing next slide okay i am going to now move over to our healthy school team update um, Going to turn things over to Jim Tackett as he has um, some great information to share. Jim. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Angie, can you um, move to the next slide? Yes. Um, so I wanted to share just a, a few things. Um, obviously, since uh, we only get together um, one or two times during the semester, uh, but uh, some of this is hot off the press. Some of it actually hasn't gone out as we speak, but will go out later uh, this week. Um, the first thing that I want to mention, based on the needs assessment that we did back in January and early February, um, and thank you to those of you that were able to give us some uh, feedback and support around PD and training uh, resources. Uh, we have been able to put together a series of three videos. I, I guess I would call them a, um, info or resource packets. Uh, and when you see these, you will you will understand. Uh, it is really a PowerPoint uh, with some video, um, live video in that, um, really addressing some of the mental health issues that um, we will see and probably have seen in some of our kiddos. Uh, upon returning to school. Um, so the, the target audiences uh, are three, as you can see on the slide. Um, so how can we all uh, work together to sort of um, uh, move the mental health, uh, social, emotional learning piece forward? So uh, these are very short, purposefully, um, but I would also uh, share with you that uh, I think they are great conversation starters, great opportunities for you to look at. Uh, as you think about summer and preparing to go back to school, um, how you can um, uh, include these and have conversations with your staff uh, and protocols and, uh, that you want to put in place when you have uh, students that 
uh, are in this situation. Um, so um, as soon as we release the, uh, the links, uh, we will make sure to make that available to you all. Uh, and we would ask that you share these far and wide uh, with as many folks as, as, um, as you see fit. Um, so please do so. Uh, the second piece again is uh, professional development. Uh, I don't have to tell you all um, uh, the importance of professional organizations, so I would encourage you to uh, to be engaged in um, uh, KSNA Kentucky School um, uh, Nurses Association and their upcoming uh, training this summer. I will tell you that if you have any interest in, in social emotional learning, um, uh, Kentucky Shape, which is the health and PE professional learning organization uh, will be doing a, uh, I guess I would say a regional um, conference as well. Um, so uh, we'll have some tremendous national presenters that will be coming in. So even if you're not uh, interested in that or you can't fit it into your uh, schedule, I would encourage you to share that with uh, some of your health and physical educators uh, in your buildings. Um, registration is now open for, for that, which will be in July. Um, next, um, again, this is uh, in the hands of our communications uh, office right now, but it's in the last uh, stop. Um, some of you may be involved in your local wellness policy uh, at the district level. Um, we have we had a, a guide that was several years old and needed uh, some revision. Uh, so that is um, going undergoing its last stop. That will be uh, out, it will be on our website, and we will make you aware of that. Again, um, whether you want to uh, peruse this and, and use that, uh, or share that with your other colleagues uh, that do have a hand in, in uh, local wellness policy. And then finally, uh, I'm not sure that we even uh, have mentioned this to you all. Um, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey uh, is a, um, a um, student-based survey um, that they self-report. Uh, we conduct that every every other year in the odd numbered years. It normally would have been um, collected and we would have been wrapping up this spring, but due to COVID, uh, that has been pushed back to the fall. Um, so schools are randomly selected by CDC um, and uh, will work with their family resource use service centers uh, to collect that data. Um, we uh, the most recent data we have we have is from 2019, so it's really prior to COVID. Um, I know the Friskies and even some of you all may use this data to help uh, guide um, not only for programming but for grant writing, etc. Um, this is on our website. I will include this link as well, uh, but I would encourage you to take a look at that, share that with your colleagues. Uh, with the caveat that it looks a whole lot different or, or part of it will look different uh, since COVID uh, has been with us uh, since the last um, rendition of this. So it will be very interesting to see what we get in regards to the fall, uh, especially in some of those uh, behavior risk factors uh, areas that, that we ask, especially uh, social emotional learning, uh, mental health, etc. So um, if you haven't seen that, I would encourage you to take a look at it. Um, very, very good infogra infographic. So I'll stop if anyone has questions. I'm happy to answer at any point. Thank you, Angie. Thank you, Jim. And um, I will say I got to preview those mental health training videos and they were amazing. I think they're going to be very well received. Um, in your schools just kind of gives everybody an idea of things just to keep an eye out for with our with our kids and, and how the things that they may be struggling with when they come since they've come back to school. So um, I encourage you guys to take full use of, of those. Um, do we have any questions for Jim yet? Stephanie? I'm not Stephanie. Laura, I'm sorry. Um, I don't see any specifically for him, but okay. we do have others. We, okay, we can, well, let's um, we we'll go to the next slide. I think we're getting close to the end. Yeah, we're getting to the question and answer portion, so go right ahead, Laura. Okay, please share the implications of HIPAA on requiring someone at the school event to show their vaccination card, or can we just accept the person on their word? 
and Dr. White can uh, chime chime in as well. But from um, the per the governor's press conference that was um, addressed with businesses, and um, he he said, you know, to just take their word for it. Um, I don't know if Dr. White has anything different that she'd like to weigh in with. No, we just got uh, guidance about uh, starting to have in-person meetings with boards and commissions. And the guidance was, was a firm people's uh, vaccination status. And if 75% of the board is, uh, is uh, vaccinated, you can have an in-person meeting, but it does not give you guidance on how do you verify that. And I think that was done in that manner uh, because of the governor's uh, uh, hope that people will take care of each other and and be truthful when asked. Yes. Because we can't force anyone to since it's a mandate and not mandated, we can't force anyone to um, reveal that information because it's not a mandatory vaccine or and it's not mandatory to attend school. So. OK. Are they still studying the antibodies on people who have had the virus? I know a doctor that is nine, nine months post COVID and still has antibodies. Uh, yes, the people that got the uh, that were in the clinical trials for um, uh, the virus for the vaccine have, are being studied, but they also are looking at people who have naturally had the 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 virus. So there are going to be some who will have a longer uh, immunity, but uh, the general public uh, answer is that they start to after three months wane. I know do know someone here in our building at the Park for Public Health that saw her uh, her levels completely disappear after three months. OK. Currently, our students with trachs are not attending school due to the need for a nebulizer treatments and suctioning frequently during the school day. Any thoughts on what to expect the next school year for the students who needs aerosolized treatments? Angie, I believe we covered that in the Healthy at Schools. So I would say that until Healthy at Schools goes away, you would still follow that guidance am i wrong um yes at least for sure for this through this school year and um the summer unless the cdc changes it because we followed cdc guidance on that so we'll be watching that very closely i mean there's it possibly could change between now and the fall we just don't know yet correct thank you okay just to clarify at graduation, regardless of it being indoors or outdoors, if students, staff or parents are fully vaccinated, they may choose to not wear a mask at graduation. Correct, if they are fully vaccinated. I have someone asking about the BRI forms that Michelle mentioned. Are they going to be emailed out? Uh, yes, absolutely. And uh, Angie and I did want to also remind you to be sure that you do check the your emails this summer because summer school will be going on. And as uh, things change, as Dr. White has has mentioned before, um, we're we're on that cusp of getting information out just as quick as we can. So yes, absolutely, everything will roll out through the listserv. Um, and we will make sure to try and limit what we put out there this summer, but there may be issues and things as we go. And I know that you all are used to just turning off the computer and you know trying to re revitalize yourselves. But Angie and I did talk about this today that it's probably a good idea that you sign on at least once a week and make sure that there's not anything very pressing that's that's out there that you might need to know about. So yes. OK, I have another one for you, Michelle. To have stock rescue inhalers and EpiPens, do districts have to have medical directors? Yes, the, the order has to come from a medical provider, a medical director. Yes. Now the and and the EpiPens have always been that way, where you've had to have a standing order, and that the actual EpiPens have to be delivered to the doctor's office, and and but yes. And there is also I, something that I did not mention. There's a big clause. There's a big paragraph in there that talks about liability and how uh, that liability is waived if you, if you act in a reasonable way. 
so the person's not liable for distributing or for administering the inhaler. Okay, I think Dr. White might have answered this, but they said, do we need proof of vaccine for students and staff? Do they have to show vaccine cards or certificates? At, the, at this time, we are not asking people to show cards or have any kind of a passport, and I don't anticipate Kentucky doing that. Individual businesses can do that, but as state agencies, uh, we are not going to be requiring that. Like airlines are requiring to see vaccination, they're requiring to see proof of testing, so they can choose to do that as a private business. Okay, with at-home COVID tests now available at Kroger, should we accept those test results since they are not coming from a verified lab or medical provider? Would we contact Trace and quarantine based on that test? And should we require the person to go home or go to a verified lab? Uh, we are working on a guidance document on that right now in the Department for Public Health. Uh, I think uh, having spent 20 years working with pregnancy tests, I do know that people will sometimes not do those correctly, but most of the time they are correct. So uh, what we, uh, we are, are trying to decide, if I do a COVID test at home and it is positive, I would treat that and isolate that person until I had a provider verified test. If the person declines to get a provider verified test, uh, then I would treat that person as if they were positive because you would rather err on that side than err on saying, oh, well, it's at a home test, probably is not right, come on in to school. If you if that is incorrect, then you could potentially uh, infect kids and staff at your at your school. So uh, we we will come out with some definite guidance soon. That's a conversation we're having in our heads. I'm not giving you advice right now, but we have a, a, a statement that we're working on that we will send to KDE when we'll send to Angie and it can be posted on the KDE website. It's a very good question and we're still mulling over that and other states are having a difficult time trying to decide how they they want to approach that. Okay, just confirming that if someone was trained for the 2021 school year to administer medications emergency and daily, then they are still allowed to distribute medications in July during summer school. That's correct. This is summer school is just an extension of this school year. So um, yes, they they can go till your summer program has ended. OK, and where will we find information regarding the regional Kentucky shape meetings? Uh, Jim, do you know have that information by any chance? Sorry, I, I couldn't find my buttons. Um, uh, yes, it is on Kentucky Shakes website, um, but I can also include that when Angie sends us out. Um, um, they're working on the specifics of the agenda, but that information is already on there. The actual early bird registration, I think, ends June 1. So. Okay, so when we, the school, call a parent to say that their child is a direct contact of a positive case, then the parent can just say, my child is vaccinated, um, therefore he or she won't be quarantining, no card proof is necessary. You would just ask them when they had their last dose, uh, and then it makes sure that that child is, uh, so that student is two weeks from the last dose um, and uh, you will be on the honor system. OK, that's all the questions. All right, thank you. Um, next slide, please. I just have a few um, dates to rem uh, just to remember. Um, the National Association of School Nurses Virtual Conference is going to be held June 21st through June 25th. Um, the entire thing was made virtual again this year. I really, really recommend, now, especially now that you have extra money for COVID, 
um, if you can, to join um, NASN and um, do these virtual, do the conference. It's amazing how much information that is packed into those four four days. Um, it's well worth the the money to go, and um, the plan is next year to be back in person. And if you have the opportunity, I encourage you to to go to a to the in person conferences because you the networking and the resources that are shared is just invaluable. Um, this is a great use. You can use ESSER funds for this. Um, so take it full advantage of that if possible. The Kentucky School Nurse Conference for this summer is July 12th through 14th. Um, the last I heard that it, it's going to be virtual and um, they were working out some details about the continuing ed. So um, just keep an eye out on the listserv for registration um, updates and forms when that becomes available. I will be doing an um, we'll be doing a KDE update at that time as well as Michelle for DPH. So anything new um, that pops up between now and then um, we'll be presenting there. Also, our district health coordinators virtual conference is scheduled for September 15th. Like I said, it's going to be virtual again this year. Watch the listserv for registration information that will be in August. We'll open that up and that's always um, free of charge. So um, keep an eye out for that. And as Michelle mentioned, watch the lift serves over the summer to stay up date, uh, up to date. Things seem to just move very quickly at this point. And I know there's so many questions that that we as nurses want to know because we're planners and we make plans for everything and we want everything to be lined up. But unfortunately, COVID has taught us that we, we've got to learn to fly by the seat of our pants and, and pivot quickly, as Ross would say on friends, pivot, pivot. Um, so just keep an eye on the listserv at least weekly and we'll up, do any updates. Also, if there's anything huge, um, you can follow the uh, Kentucky Department of Education on Twitter and Facebook that um, if we have huge health, big updates that we will share that on so social media as well. Um, and let's see. Um, and as Dr. White talked about, you know, how we were looking back now at the things that we did well with COVID and the things maybe we didn't do as well. I've been asked to serve on a committee with the National Association of State School Nurse Consultants to, to look at this at a national level that what did our states do that worked well and things that did not work well. And um, as that information becomes available, I will share that with the group as well. Um, do we have any more last minute questions before we sign off? Just one more. The current mask mandate requires that K-12 staff and students continue to wear masks. Would this not apply to graduation and indoor graduation? Um, Dr. White, you're on mute. Yeah. yeah, I just realized I was on mute. Uh, I understood the question was talking about an outdoor graduation. Uh, but um, I would say, oh, that's a really good question. That if it's indoor, we, you would definitely be wearing a mask because of the healthy at school. Yes, healthy at school guidelines will stay in place until the end of this school year. And that's the and the CDC recommend recommendations are that they stay in place through the end of the school year as well. So indoor, I would definitely do masks. Okay, that's all the questions. Great. Well, thank you everyone for uh, tuning in today. Um, check in on our webpage and um, by the first part of next week as we hope to have our question and answer document, the PowerPoint and um, video all posted for um, review. If you have any questions um, later on, you can email myself, Michelle or Michelle and we'll get them routed to the correct people if we don't have the answers. And thank you all. I can't thank you enough for what you've done for this school. 
for this school year. You know, we're we're at the end of the Ironman triathlon, and we're crawling on our elbows, you know, with the skin knees and a bloody stump that we're dragging behind us. But we're almost to the end, and we've come so far. Let's let's finish um, healthy and alive. So keep doing what you're doing. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers today. Uh, Jim and Michelle, and especially to Dr. White for um, giving us uh, so much of her valuable time. And um, we, if we don't see you, then I'll see you at KSNA in July. Thank you and have a great rest of the week. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you.